Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event hosted by the University of Bath Institute of Policy Research. Thank you for joining us online for the third event in our series in Oceans. My name is Ian White. Uh, I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University, and I'm delighted to be here to be welcoming you this evening. The oceans cover 71% of our planet's surface. We rely on them to support human life and our economic, cultural, social, and environmental well being. But our oceans are under threat. With the effects of climate change increasingly evident, seawater temperatures are rising rapidly. Continued ocean warming is projected to lead to marine ecosystems disappearing, systems which are essential for biodiversity and food and livelihood for millions of people. Protecting natural carbon storage is one way that exports believe we can help slow down the increase in global temperature. By increasing the number of coastal mangroves, seagrass and salt marshes, experts believe we can reduce carbon emissions and help revitalize the ocean. I look forward to listening to our speaker this evening, Stephen Lutz, who will tell us more about this in his lecture on blue carbon. Stephen, thank you for joining us. And we're delighted to welcome you this evening. And I look forward to hearing about your work in this area. Here across the university, we too are making great strides in our own research on protecting our oceans and coastal regions through our research centers including the Centre for Space, Atmospheric and Oceanic Science, the Water Innovation Research Centre, and the Centre for Sustainable and Circular Technologies. We're also pleased to have launched two Bath Beacons relating to our oceans and climate change, including the Zero Carbon Offshore Power and Living Well Now and by 2050. These are both multidisciplinary partnerships across the university working to empower our research expertise and help tackle major global challenges such as those we are facing today. Stephen, thank you again for joining us and thank you to all for watching online. And so it's my pleasure now to pass over to the director of the IPR, Professor Nick Pierce, for a short introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Vice Chancellor. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and I would like also to extend my welcome to you all uh, this, this evening and to Stephen for joining us uh, to give tonight's lecture. And the Vice Chancellor has set out very clearly a number of the issues that we're concerned with in the series of lectures we're holding at the Institute on our oceans. Um, and tonight we're very pleased to be joined by Stephen to talk about the concept and the issues involved in blue carbon. Um, the ocean series that we are um, uh, undertaking ranges from issues about climate science and climate change's impact on the oceans through to thinking about the oceans as climate stores, carbon stores, through to maritime uh, sustainability, the sustainability of resource extraction, fishing and so on in our oceans. And we will also be looking at questions of the geopolitics of our oceans, how um, nations relate to each other in shared oceanic spaces, uh, some of the security and other issues that arise in those, uh, in those circumstances, and the history of how we thought about oceans um, and what historians can tell us about some of the issues we face today from their own study of the past. So it's a very wide ranging uh, series. And as I say tonight, Stephen Lutz will be joining us to talk about uh, blue carbon. Now, Stephen is a senior program officer and blue carbon lead at Grid Arendelle, speaking to us uh, this evening from Arendelle in Norway. There he works to advance uh, the concept of blue carbon through national demonstrations and in international treaties. And this includes the development and management of the Abu Dhabi Blue Carbon Demonstration Project and the Global Environments Facilities Blue Forest Projects on behalf of the UN Environment. Um, so he's been involved in several uh, major projects helping to address uh, blue carbon issues, but also questions of plastic pollution on our coasts and our oceans. Uh, and Steve is also a policy advisor to the Ocean Foundation. He's a very distinguished career in this field, working in the US and in other international organizations. So there's a lot to teach us this evening. Um, so I'm gonna, in a minute, open up to Steve and ask him to uh, give his lecture. When he's done that, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. Please do put your uh, questions in the Q&A function and we can use those. 
I'll collect those and then we can discuss them, uh, put them to Stephen. Uh, if you're on social media, do use the hashtag at IPR Oceans or tag us at Uni of Bath uh, IPR. And just a final thing to say is that the session is being recorded. So film and photography is taking place and subject to no technical difficulties, the session will be available online as a podcast and a video at a later date. So thank you again for joining us and I will now pass over to Stephen. Stephen. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much to Nick, Ian, um, and the organizers, the University of Bath and the IPR. Um, I'm very, I'm very pleased to be coming here today and sharing some views on the, on how we can harness the value of blue carbon and achieve goals in conservation and climate change. Um, my name, as as you mentioned, I, 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 I'm the blue carbon lead and a senior project uh, manager at Grid Arendal a Norwegian foundation located in Arendelle, Norway. And tonight I'll be discussing the potential mitigation impacts of conserving and restoring coastal and marine ecosystems, including uh, mangroves, salt marshes, seagrass beds, and marine fauna. I will also share with you the latest in harnessing this value of blue carbon to achieve goals in conservation, climate change, and sustainability. So just a little sort of history lesson on blue carbon. The concept of blue carbon was introduced in late 2009 in a lead up to the Copenhagen uh, International Climate Change Meeting or COP15. It was introduced through two reports published by the UN Environment Program and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This was the blue carbon report uh, published by Grid Arndal with um, uh, UN Environment and the IUCN's management of natural coastal carbon sinks. These reports um, stimulated and galvanized interest in merging marine conservation with climate action. Now, by through the years after 2009, 2010, um, NGOs, non-government organizations, and civil society has seen themselves as being highly efficient at getting national states with large coastal areas interested in climate mitigation via wetland conservation and restoration, as well as raising public awareness to the importance of climate and coasts, uh, of coasts to our climate, and also um, galvanizing interest in science to address the key questions that um, will help us sort of harness this value. So a little terminology um, before we go forward. And as, as, as it was mentioned, I managed the Blue Forests Project and have a, a sort of a blue forest approach, but we also work on blue carbon. So blue forests are the coastal and marine ecosystems that store carbon and support a multitude of ecosystem services and co-benefits. And blue carbon essentially is the carbon that is sequestered by the oceans and coastal ecosystems, okay? And it's coastal blue carbon, which has been the most uh, uh, focused um, ecosystems uh, for advancing this sort of the value of blue carbon. And that is, as I mentioned, the seagrasses, salt marshes, and uh, mangroves. But also, um, uh, there are uh, the ecosystems of kelp and seaweed is gaining a lot of traction. In Norway, we're uh, through, through efforts such as the Norwegian Blue Forest Network, we're looking at how kelp can help store and sequester carbon in the oceans. And there's been a lot of recent attention on macroalgae and seaweed and its potential role in um, being used to help mitigate climate change, the impacts of climate change. So why are these coastal habitats important? Well, as you can see from the graphic on the right, coastal blue carbon habitats sequester a lot of carbon. Sequestration is the annual uptake of carbon into plant biomass and soils. The carbon flux into these habitats every year is up to over 10 times as much carbon into their soils as terrestrial forests. So the graphic on the left illustrates that soil coastal ecosystems, so the soil in the coastal ecosystems can store an enormous amounts of carbon compared to terrestrial forests as well. And that carbon is mostly stored in soils, not in biomass, okay? So how does it store it? So it, it basically takes that, that carbon through the, the photosynthesis in the leaves and, and through the, the roots of the mangroves, it helps store that carbon in PT sediments. And the, and the key thing here is, is that it's, there's a lot of carbon that's stored in these PT sediments 
And once it's below the water level, it's out of contact, it's already out of contact with the atmosphere. So these, these ecosystems, even though they might habit, habit, might habitat or might, might exist on the fringes of our um, coastlines, are very effective and important for carbon um, as carbon sinks and is, as potential nature-based solutions to climate change, i.e. their conservation and restoration. And you can see here um, between these three uh, typical coastal blue carbon ecosystems that blue carbon is found almost anywhere in the world. Um, Seagrasses is all over the place from, from the Arctic to, the, to almost the sub-Arctic. Uh, and uh, mangroves is in uh, uh, tropical climates and salt marshes in temperate climates. Okay. And this, okay. However, as was, as was mentioned by Ian, uh, you know, there's a lot of degradation to our coasts and our oceans. Coastal habitats are some of the most threatened ecosystems in the world. And we're losing these habit habitats rapidly at rates ranging from 0.7 to up to seven of their global coverage each year. And when these ecosystems are degraded or destroyed, they go from being impressive natural carbon sinks to, be, to becoming very large carbon sources. So for example, uh, there's a picture of these mangroves that were cut down. Well, all that, all that peat is now exposed. And when you convert a mangrove area into an aquaculture pond, um, there's going to be an exchange of an escape of gases into the atmosphere. And that's what we don't want. We don't want these gases that have built up over hundreds or even potentially uh, thousands of years to be escaping into the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. Um, and when these ecosystems are degraded, there are many other important ecosystem benefits that they, that they provide us are impacted. These habitats are important for biodiversity. Um, they're important for uh, fish habitat, they provide awesome opportunities for recreation, and they're important for protection of coastal, from coastal storms and from flooding, among other important ecosystem benefits. So it was within that context, the threat that these ecosystems face and the need for their protection, that the Global Environment Facility, and the Global Environment Facility is one of the largest um, environmental funding bodies on the planet, was interested in advancing the science around coastal blue carbon and understanding how that value could be, uh, could be harnessed and the value of other ecosystem benefits could be, could be harnessed to support conservation, climate action, and sustainable livelihoods. In 2011, the, uh, the Jeff Council signaled that they would like to uh, develop this project it was developed and, and, and launched in 2015 till 2021. So it's just completed and we're just sort of wrapping up the reporting of it. Essentially, it's been the uh, largest exploration of the value of blue carbon on the planet. And I've been very privileged to coordinate and manage this project um, on behalf of the United Nations Environment Program with the support of the Global Environment Facility and the multitude of really important and key partners that are listed here, um, that are shown here below our sort of map. And the map also shows our sort of intervention sites, as you can see in little blue dots around there, okay? Prior to the project, the science around coastal blue carbon and ecosystem services contained many gaps. And there were very few proof of concept or on the ground examples around the world. On the ground examples, meaning how you could harness this value to achieve a goal in conservation, et cetera. Additionally, the international community did not fully recognize the value of these ecosystems for climate change mitigation. The Blue Forest Project has been key in overcoming these hurdles in order to affect a truly transformative global impact on coastal ecosystem management and sustainability. And the end result is a project that had definitely punched above its weight. The total funding from the, environment, the Global Environment Facility was $4.5 million. Um, with partner co-finance, I think it put up to about 21 or $27 million, uh, which is not a gigantic project, by the way. Um, and these are the types of, uh, I, I would say that harnessing this sort of value of blue carbon and these other ecosystem benefits uh, is, there was multiple ways that you could do this. I've got a, a slide here looking at these different pathways that we've used or explored to harness this value. Okay, it includes how you can, you can use the value of blue carbon 
to support national policy and management goals. So for example, if you have a mangrove management plan, you can incorporate the value of carbon and now you've got a different, an, an extra parameter to report on, okay? But the, the first pathway there is, blue, is carbon finance. So that has been very uh, attractive uh, to the blue carbon movement, basically how you could potentially um, use the value of blue carbon to, to create funds, uh, private finance and the voluntary carbon market. And we've explored through the Blue Forest Project and, 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 par and parties around the world, um, how you could harness this value at a multitude of scales. So not just the carbon finance, not just the national policy, but also addressing international commitments and in other mechanisms. And I'll get into that a little bit um, later, but basically looking at incentive-based ways of supporting conservation through these values. Okay. So one project, and this was actually a, a, a sort of a preview project to the, to, the, to the UN Environment's Blue Forest Project, was the exploration that we did in Abu Dhabi with our partners, the Abu Dhabi Global Data Initiative. And um, this was a, a blue carbon exploration for the Emirates of Abu Dhabi that Gridarndal um, uh, developed and managed on behalf of, of, of Jedi. And we explored this sort of value in um, the United Arab Emirates uh, for seagrasses, mangroves, salt marshes, uh, coastal uh, sabka and algal mats. And it, it was, in, it, the, the project in, included a lot of on the ground field testing. So we had to get data on, data points on maps basically. Um, it was a very data heavy, heavy rich sort of project in order to explore how, how much this value could be worth to the United Arab Emirates. Now, our exploration uh, showed that, that maybe the, the, the carbon finance or the voluntary carbon market harnessing of blue carbon in the United Arab Emirates was not entirely feasible because there's, it's related to the cost of development on the, um, on the coastline in the United Arab Emirates. Let's just say that when you have the Burj Khalifa, which is, which is the highest um, uh, building in the United Arab Emirates with Tom Cruise swinging around it in Mission Imp Impossible, we really can't offset the building, the cost of that um, building with the mangroves that are existing or the mangrove carbon that is existing there. However, we were able to in integrate um, blue carbon into uh, policy at multiple scales from municipal to the Emirates or state level and to national. And this project was upscaled nationally. So they, the Emiratis took this project from the Emirates of Abu Dhabi and, and it replicated it throughout the entire country. And also um, the, the, the Emirates included this project in their, their national climate pledge or national determined contribution to the UNFCCC. And they were able to use this project and showcase their leadership on uh, this environmental issue regionally and internationally. So I think the UAE um, did pretty well with this project and they're continuing to do extremely well on advancing this understanding there. And these are, uh, this is just a quick slide on the ecosystems that were studied there. You have the seagrass meadows, your, your intertidal cyanobacterial mats, the coastal sabka, which is a very sort of very, very salty salt marsh mangroves in your, in your typical so much. Okay, so the, the next project site, which I'm gonna sort of quickly illustrate is in Kenya. And we had two, we had actually two, two project sites in Kenya, one in Vanga Bay and one in, in Gazi Bay. And these also included um, uh, scientists going out, uh, doing samples, um, engagement with community, education, policy engagement, um, engagement with the, with the relevant ministries in the Kenyan government. And what we did with the, what was occurring at these project sites was, it was the carbon finance side. Basically, how can we harness the value of blue carbon to achieve um, voluntary carbon offsets, which will, which will result in revenue to communities in coastal Kenya. So in Kenya, our, at that project outside in 2015, only 117 hectares of mangrove forests were recognized in carbon offsetting. And through the actions of our project, over 3,000 hectares of mangrove forests now supports local community-based conservation and refer 
and restoration efforts, with actual profit from voluntary carbon offset trading, supporting community initiatives such as purchasing of school books for local children, the building of freshwater wells, and recently COVID education. So in Kenya, the, the payments from oh sorry, in Kenya the payments from the voluntary carbon market. Um, have support, basically are paying for conservation and restoration activities with, with that, um, with that extra, extra profit. Project bef beneficiaries of, in Kenya include five communities and over 20,000 people. And right now we're, t we're testing, or our project partners are testing how to incorporate seagrass in the voluntary carbon offsets. So it's not just going to be for mangroves. And our significant results um, is that we've not just been able to sort of pilot blue carbon on the voluntary carbon market, um, but it's being upscaled throughout um, Kenya, and it's being used as an example um, throughout um, Eastern Africa, and it's also uh, contributing in Kenya's nationally determined contribution to fulfill the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and so in Madagascar, through our partner, um, Blue Ventures, which is a UK-based organization, um, we we're essentially able to, to, to trial or test a, a similar type of approach under carbon finance um, than we did in, um, in, in, in Kenya. It, obviously, it's a, it's a bit different of, a, of an area, but it's, it's the Bay of Assassins uh, in southwest Madagascar. We looked at incorporating um, uh, a, a, a project called Tahari Honko. It's about 12,030 12, hectares of mangrove forests. So again, a focus on mangroves and uh, basically community education, community engagement, community agree agreeing to, um, to undertake the conservation and restoration activities, the government agreeing that the community can um, receive the funds from the voluntary carbon offsets, and then, and then hopefully the funds going towards uh, conservation and restoration activities. Okay. And this um, community-based carbon finance is certified, not just for Madagascar, but for also for Kenya as well, under the Plan Vigo standard, which is, I think, also based in the U United Kingdom. Um, and the project beneficiaries are in nine communities in, uh, in coastal Kenya. And local conservation there is, 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 and sustainable management is supported also through a sustainable oct octopus fishery. So multiple types of values have been harnessed to support communities there. So not just the blue carbon, but other types of ecosystem benefits can be harnessed. Um, so in Madagascar and Kenya, through Blue Ventures and the Kenyan Moon Fisheries Research Institute, the project was able to test and expand the area of mangrove carbon on the voluntary carbon market by over uh, an order of magnitude, well over an order, well over an order of magnitude. Okay, so I'll bring you to the, and I've got more project sites, but I'm just going to do one more. I um, don't want to belabor it, but there, it, we also trialed sort of harnessing the value of um, coastal ecosystems and, and how to uh, use it to achieve uh, goals in, in, in conservation and climate change in Ecuador. And our partner there was Conservation International. Um, and Conservation International in Ecuador focused on mainstreaming information about mangrove ecosystem services into national policy frameworks, developing uh, useful concepts under those frameworks, language tools for policymakers, and to take action on sustainable conservation uh, and restoration of mangroves. And how was this supported? Well, the vehicle there was actually through um, fishing. So basically looking at um, they, they set up basically mangrove conservation agreements with local communities. And this was an agreement between these communities and the national government. And what the communities get from this agreement or the, the, the fishing associations that represent the communities is they get exclusive access to the red crab fishery and other fisheries that the mangrove ecosystems produce. And this is quite lucrative and important for um, these, these communities. And what the government gets is additional support for the management of these ecosystems. And this is a sort of a, an incentive management scheme um, that now covers over 40,000 hectares of mangroves in Ecuador. And we're hoping to have that replicated throughout the region and maybe internationally. But it wasn't just the sort of local um, or national scale uh, projects that we pursued 
through the Blue Forest Project. We also, uh, primarily through our partner, International Union of Conservation International, um, but also through others, um, looked at how to increase international acceptance of the value of blue carbon. So basically, this is also in respond to uh, calls from developing countries to help with the uh, potential uh, needs that they face in the face of climate change. So this is a, we did an analysis um, for the Marrakesh COP just a, a few years ago and produced the first inventory and assessment of blue carbon in nationally determined contributions. And this is also quite relevant for last year's uh, international climate change meeting in Glasgow, where you had a lot, a lot of focus on uh, coasts and oceans. And uh, we've been able to, I think, increase these numbers by, by a few countries. And there's more in the ways because it's not just um, recognizing this value, but it's also maybe making uh, actual measurable targets in these, in these national pledges. So, so essentially over 28 countries include reference to coastal wetlands in terms of mitigation and 59 countries include these ecosystems in terms of adaptation strategies. Okay. So how are these ecosystems sort of referred to overall in these nationally determined contributions? It's not just carbon. Okay. So as you could see from the last slide, more countries recognized these ecosystems for adaptation, their adaptation values over mitigation. Um, and there are a range of other types of benefits that are recognized um, for these ecosystems by these national pledges. So for example, fisheries, ecotourism, rec recreation, coastal protection, food security, energy resources, et cetera. Um, but, and this is just a sort of a, a reflection on coastal blue carbon, there has been some concerns over uh, the implementation of blue carbon. So this, this poster that, I, that I'm showing here comes to us from the Paris climate change meeting, or at least the fringes of the Paris climate change meeting, where there was actually a, a protest um, by groups on the potential dangers of implementing blue carbon, at least the potential dangers that they saw um, related to uh, climate justice and potential social justice. Okay, and that is that um, if a, uh, a, a purely economic um, view is adv advanced with regard to these ecosystems and climate, then it may disenfranchise um, communities that these ecosystems are so important to. In response to this, we developed something called the Blue Carbon Code of Conduct, um, which hopefully will ensure that blue carbon projects will uh, be equitable and uh, socially just as possible. And I am happy to say that the projects that we have advanced through the Blue Forest Project do follow this code. But other concerns are that, uh, you know, right now we have um, the price of carbon on the voluntary carbon market for nature-based offsets has risen um, in the past few months from some, somewhere around about $4 a ton to over $14 a ton, and it's expected to go to $50 a ton. So there's an explosion of desire in the market in the carbon market for these types of nature-based projects. Well, frankly, we don't have those projects on the ground. We don't have the projects right now um, to implement because it takes a few years uh, to, to sort of set them up. And, and, and it's not beyond <laughs> more than a couple of weeks that I get approached by a carbon broker looking for projects. So we need these projects immediately. Secondly, um, the implementation capacity. I think um, we definitely need capacity of science in uh, developing countries regionally to help with this implementation of projects, because we can't just simply just fly white Western uh, European scientists or American scientists around to do the work for um, in these countries, especially if you want these projects and these, these outputs to be sustainable over the long term. Okay, there's also the potential of sort of overselling the concept. Yes, blue carbon is important, but is it going to mitigate all of our emissions? No, we have to first reduce emissions. Uh, I think if we stopped uh, reducing emissions right now, we'd still have to have these nature-based solutions, but they're not the excuse. They shouldn't, we shouldn't be looking at just, just blue carbon and not other thing, and not um, the, the mitigation of emissions. And then, and then finally, I'll just sort of quick, quick tie this, this up is that um, these other ecosystem benefits 
should be recognized and um, and harnessed. So not just the, the mangrove crab, but there's also mangrove honey. All these other things can create jobs and revenue for coastal communities, and they should be explored. Okay. And so a little, I'm gonna end or, or go towards the ending um, with some reflections on sort of horizons in blue carbon. And I mentioned a little bit on kelp and, um, and macroalgae. I'm not going to actually talk about that. What I'm going to talk about is um, how through the Blue Forest Project and with other par partners and parties, we've explored blue carbon beyond the coast. Okay, so discussions on marine vertebrate and carbon services actually began in 2008, but are only recently emerging uh, with a wider range of uh, interest in climate conservation scientists and uh, in, uh, in discussions. And although the scientific foundation for the recognition of marine life or the roles that marine life play potentially in climate change mitigation is still being laid, and there may be jurisdiction or, and, and I guess measurability issues to overcome, the concept is rapidly gaining interest and uh, uh, traction. Uh, and I'm not the only one who is recognizing the, the contributions of marine vertebrates and their potential uh, to help in blue carbon. So through partner co-finance, we've been, we've been we supported interest in this subject from scientists, um, parties at the International Monetary Fund, discussions on the value of whale carbon at the International Whaling Commission, at the UN Oceans meetings and other events, okay? And what is this, what is, what am I, what is he stretching here? What, are, what is he talking about? Well, basically all marine life and the biodiversity that they represent are an important factor to the bio and geochemical cycles of the oceans, including their corpses and excrements. But what we're talking about here is different pathways, pumps and trophic cascades related to carbon functions in the oceans and the bi ocean's biological carbon pump. So one of these is whales. So when whales feed at depth, they bring up nutrients to the ocean surface through their vertical movement. Okay. And through the waste products of, of whales, yes, the whale poo, I hope everybody's had dinner already, can, can, that, that whale poo um, contains exactly what the phytoplankton needs to grow, notably iron and nitrogen. And the phytoplankton is our sort of floating marine life out there, our primary production. So just like the sea grasses or the or the, um, or the leaves of the mangroves, the phytoplankton is, is fixing the carbon in the surface waters. Yes. Uh, and whales through, also through their annual migrations transport nutrients across the ocean. And this natural ocean fertilization activity can potentially significant and enhance phytoplankton growth in whales' habitats. And scientists have noted that whales, where whales swim, their, their sort of natural pathways up and down the coasts, they're actually maybe helping to stimulate this phytoplankton growth as well. During the lifetimes of whales, uh, store, they store carbon in their bodies and upon natural expir expiration of death, they bring that carbon to the sea floor. And that's exactly where we want the carbon to be. Because unlike in your uh, terrestrial ecosystems where you know, carbon is stored in trees in terms of hundreds of years, or even your coastal ecosystems, where it's also stored in hundreds of years, um, when carbon gets below the surface layer, when it gets down to 100 meters or below, it can be stored in, in terms of thousands of years. And if that carbon gets incorporated into the deep ocean floor or the marine sediments, it's stored in potentially mille millennia. So if you think of, of, of dinosaurs, of, of, of fossils of dinosaurs, of swimming dinosaurs, well, those were the actual carbon units of that day. So, so fish carbon and, and whale carbon is actually something that could, that could take carbon, um, large amounts of carbon from the water and take it down. So fish, fish carbon is, is, is and there, there's, there's a number of mechanisms here, um, but basically it looks at how Fish also uh, store carbon in their, in, their, in their biomass and also through excretion help transport carbon down to the sea floor. And what I mean there is that the phytoplankton that is associated with the, the carbon that is associated with the phytoplankton exists in a different sort of scale as, as carbon associated with uh, f fish fecal pellets. So plant, carbon associated with phytoplankton sort of floats around and uh, eventually settles 
but the carbon that is associated with the fecal pellets that come out of something like a, a giant bluefin tuna um, can rapidly sink down to the bottom of the ocean. And that's, like I said, in 1968. In 2019, researchers at the International Monetary Fund uh, estimated that in terms of carbon sequestration and climate mitigation, each great whale sequesters an estimated 33 tons of carbon. Essentially, one whale is worth a thousand trees in terms of carbon absorption. Combined with the other economic benefits, the researchers estimated that the great whales are worth $2 million individually, which alludes to a vastly important role that marine life plays in the blue economy and a, a hint at, 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 at how value the, valuable these are to the global good. And another sort of mechanism is um, I would call a sea turtle carbon, or sea, this is actually related to seagrasses, but, um, but basically it's not just the whales. Researchers have found, and not just the whales and the fish, but it's, researchers have found that selective grazing by sea turtles stimulates regenerative growths and maintains diverse seagrass ecosystems. So the, 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 if you have an optimal population of sea turtles, optimal seagrass health. So this promotes healthy seagrasses with high bio, biomass and therefore carbon sequestration. However, when sea turtles are overfished or when their predators such as sharks are removed, it creates an unbalanced ecosystem and reduced carbon sequestration. So when sharks are, are overfished, uh, there's an overgrazing of the sea turtles and uh, potential uh, sea, sea meadow extinction. Or when the sea turtles are overfished, um, th there's a potential for algal dominance and degradation of the ecosystems uh, of the, sea, of the, seagrass, of the sea grasses. So on a personal note, and, and maybe this is a, a better way of sort of reflecting this, a few years ago, when I was based out of the uh, University of Southern California, I found myself on a Perth Seine fishing boat at night which was fishing for anchovy, these, these small little schooling fish, or small fish in gigantic schools, all fish. Purse seines are gigantic nets that the fishermen use to encircle and scoop these, these little, large schools of little fish. And at night, I could see the fish in the net illuminated by a searchlight coming down. And I noticed, um, obviously, the fish, because they're silvery and getting reflected, but I also noticed a lot of little reflecting particles sinking down around the fish. I asked the captain about this, and he said they eat and they defecate all the time, just like us. And now, through the latest science on fish carbon, which is really only, the science has only really exploded in the past few years. It's a very new field in, in science. But, but through that lens, I now see that gigantic school of anchovy as a gigantic swimming natural factory of carbon sequestration. And uh, this, is, this is just one of the um, uh, papers that, that came out recently. This one came out in 2021, estimating that a shortage of fish species uh, or fish poo is contributing to shifts in the ocean's carbon cycle of an equivalent magnitude to that of the impact of climate change on the ocean. So essentially overfishing equates to reduced ocean carbon function. And this is, this is really exciting because it means that, you know, we can not only just conserve and restore our uh, coasts, but also um, the marine life in our oceans and the habitats that they depend on, and that a restored ocean and a healthy ocean will um, help take care of us as well in the carbon context. Um, however, it's, it's not all, all rosy um, beds out there because... Um, this is a, 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 I've got a little a, a selection here from uh, a, a policy brief that was released in front of the Glasgow climate meeting. And so, you know, the question here is how do, how is this sort of value of oceanic blue carbon viewed by the coastal blue carbon community, uh, uh, civil society? And so far, I, I, I don't know if they've read the latest um, research, but they don't recognize it as a uh, important potential uh, climate mitigation uh, vehicle. So we still got some work to do. Maybe there is some favoritism within the um, coastal blue carbon community or the community that currently works on blue carbon. Um, but essentially, uh, the conservation of uh, marine life is, is increasingly being recognized in science 
as a potential avenue for climate mitigation and, and will be resulting in climate policies. And we know that because Greta Arndahl and, and myself and others did an assessment with our, our, our colleagues in the United Arab Emirates, looking at this, 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 this value of oceanic blue carbon and, and trying to understand if it is relevant to policy, okay? And the perception that we got from our survey with stakeholders and policymakers in the United Arab Emirates is that it is extremely relevant to policy and should be included and should be recognized and should be studied. Um, and we're not the only ones, uh, the UAE is not the only country that's, that's interested in this. For example, in, in Chile, they're, they're looking at um, harnessing the value of whale carbon to potentially uh, use it to, to, for fines uh, on ships that, that strike whales and kill whales. So you can imagine if a ship is, is steaming along, along the coasts and business as usual is just hit as many whales as you like. But if um, a government says, okay, if you hit a whale in my waters, I'm gonna fine you $2 million. Well, that's gonna change some, well, that's gonna make changes. That's, that's gonna make strong changes. So it's not, just, um, it's not just valuing the carbon, but these eco other ecosystem benefits. And it's not just carbon finance. There's other ways that these values can be used in policy and management. So ultimately for the oceanic blue carbon side, the, the question is what's the, the biological carbon sequestration value of a living ocean versus a depleted one? But also, what's its total significance? Is it a big number? Is it going to is it is it going to lead to significant um, uh, mitigation of emissions? And do we have the ability to measure it and account for it? Because it, it may be that it could be quite difficult to uh, measure every time a whale poops in the ocean. Um, so we've got some scientific hurdles to measure and model this. Um, but overall. Overfished oceans, you know, just like on, on the coasts, our, our oceans are degraded as well. Oceanic blue carbon is not what it used to be. We have overfished much of our oceans and whales are at historically low levels of abundance. In the 1950s, only 1% of the high seas was fished to, uh, and 0% of species were identified as exploited, overexploited, or collapsed. Can you imagine the potential oceanic blue carbon sequester sequestration ability of the ocean in the 50s that would be on the I guess the on, on the on the left hand side of the screen versus with that of today and historical references can give us some ex ref reflection on the true potential of what we're missing for example cod were reported larger as individuals and so commonplace in the sea around Newfoundland that it was difficult to row a boat through a school of them. And you have other reflections um, from marine life before we actually started uh, exploiting it, which can give you an idea of, of potentially what our ocean was doing for us. So with that, and I think I've kept it on time, um, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I'm happy, I'm happy for, for questions. Um, and, uh, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. I mean, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, fantastic presentation. And uh, I have to say, I had no idea about the, 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 uh, the potential for our um, fish stocks and our marine life and oceanic life to support uh, carbon sequestration in this way. I mean, one whale equals a thousand trees is an, is an incredible statistic that you yep. use. Um, and the links between overfishing and uh, you know, maritime industry and blue carbon, I think, is, in, is a really important issue for us to explore. Um, we've got some questions uh, in the chat, which I'd like to put to you, Stephen. Sure. Um, but I, I just wanted to start just with the, just if you like, with the kind of uh, the, the geopolitics of it. I mean, you talked about um, uh, 28 countries, I think I heard you say, 28 countries that had committed to uh, blue carbon conservation projects in their nationally determined contributions uh, at uh, COP26 at Glasgow. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you know, and you also mentioned, you know, the lack of projects that can, as it were, uh, uh, absorb the carbon finance that's, that's available, um, that you've got this mismatch um, between the carbon finance that's available through offsetting and so on into projects. And I just wonder, um, you know, where are the big players? Where are China, India, the US, 
um, countries, uh, you know, that, that themselves obviously have, uh, you know, significant oceanic coasts, but also significant fishing industries, and are the, obviously the major carbon uh, emitters. Uh, where are they on this agenda of blue carbon? Okay, so the US is, is firmly behind blue carbon. They have a national working group, which is focused on coastal ecosystems. And uh, there is interest in oceanic blue carbon as well. Through There was a, just a report released by the Gulf of Farallon's National Sanctuary um, last year that looked at blue carbon in national sanctuaries. It was looking at kelp carbon and well carbon at, at the same time. I think the, the, the national government in the US is mostly focused on coastal carbon. You have a number of um, blue carbon legislation on Capitol Hill right now being considered, um, which is also focused on coastal uh, ecosystems. But I think there's a, there's a drive and an interest to explore this sort of oceanic blue carbon value. And then for China, just actually a couple uh, days ago, China released a um, uh, sort of its national policy for its coast and its oceans, mostly fa focused on plastics and the rest and the conservation restoration of bays, but also has a blue carbon component. I haven't been able to translate or find an English copy yet, but I do know that coastal blue carbon and oceanic blue carbon is being explored in China. So they're interested in this sort of coastal regeneration, but also in this sort of fish biomass. And I'm, I'm really keen to see exactly what the Chinese are up to there. Um, because that could be quite innovative, but they, they definitely recognize the fish side of things as well. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, when the Chinese do something and do so at such scale. It's the, exactly. It's not going to be little. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'd be, be enormous. Um, so there's a couple of questions from Ian Cable in the chat, which I wanted to ask you. The first is, you know, what do you think about ideas of growing macroalgae in open ocean areas of the ocean for massive carbon capture for use in terrestrial ecosystems and industries for food, fertilizer? biofuel and so on yeah um, I, you could I, if you want me to just jump into that yeah you could spend i mean a whole presentation on that and um you know i i deal with with mostly sort of blue carbon in an, in a sort of restoration of a natural ecosystem this is it goes into aquaculture i would say that it, it, it sounds interesting and there's lots of people that are exploring this right now and the, and the UN environment is interested in exploring the potential impacts of that so maybe we don't have those answers yet. But just to say that, you know, it's, 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 it's potentially, you know, potentially significant, but also is potentially difficult to have a, a, a structure out in the ocean that's doing these things um, at low cost. That can actually um, be, be not impacted by storms. But when we um, when we actually had the first blue carbon lecture or presentation at the World Bank back in 2010, um, part of the presentation was somebody that got up and said um, that, that that you could do macroalgae for carbon sequestration and make jet fuel at the same time. So this is not a, not a um, a question that hasn't been raised before. But at least I know that we're we're seeing a lot of money being uh, um, advanced in it. Uh, yeah, great. Um, uh, the sec second question is from Mara, which is um, asking about what, what's the difference basically between uh, original ecosystems and restored ecosystems, particularly talking about mangroves, um, in their sequestration um, uh, abil uh, you know, ability. So basically, you know, uh, how well does a restored ecosystem perform in carbon sequestration terms compared to a uh, uh, an, an original one? Um, well, you really want to keep the, oh, sorry. Light, lights go off automatically here, so get to get in the dark. Um, but you really want to keep your, your, your existing ecosystems because when you replant a mangrove, it's going to take years, you know, tens of years for it to start building up that biomass in the sediment. Um, so, you know, the, the, the real, the, the key thing is let's conserve what we have. Restoration is good, but it's going to be a different type of carbon offset and a different type of value. Although there is a, a methodology out there for carbon offsetting and um, restoration of areas as well. Of blue carbon habitats. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, let, let me just go through some. Let me just go through some other uh, questions. Um, ben Wilson says, whales, turtles, and restored habitats are good, but given the emergency, why are we not putting our organic waste carbon, i.e. our sewage, directly on the deep seabed, especially in, in, in anoxic zones? Um, I, 
I, I, I, I don't know if I can really answer that. I, I, I would just say, and, I, and this is unqualified um, response because I have not looked at that. Um, but obviously, there will be potential impacts from from putting sewage into uh, deep ocean waters. Right now, there's there's a lot of interest in in, in things that sound really out there. In fact, um, iron fertilization is back on the uh, agenda, and they've sort of rebranded themselves as um, not not just for carbon, but for the restoration of whale populations. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting days, but within within the whole climate sphere, um, there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, 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 of far out there ideas. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, another question here is from uh, Jay Joint, which says, do you, do you think the VCM methodologies are too restrictive, which lead to fewer projects being completed? Should we have more methodologies or revisions to current methodologies that would spur more projects? And given the benefits of having the revenue from these credits for communities, I wonder if we shouldn't be providing more incentives to using this mechanism. There probably should be more incentives for using this mechanism and for allowing communities, especially in developing countries, to access these mechanisms. I don't know if there's 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 not enough. I mean, but I, I think um, there there is a there is a, a, a I would say a, a limitation. Uh, for communities to actually access them because of, of, I mean, are they too complex? I mean, the whole point here is that we're supposed to make sure that there's a robust accountability for the carbon offsetting. Otherwise, if we lo lower the standards for communities thinking they're going to do well, we might be lowering the standards for those that will do things like double counting, or we won't be realizing the additionality of our actions, because it, it, it may be that, you know, if we plant, if we conserve a mangrove here, then that take occurs someplace else, or the, or the person that was going to chop down that mangrove simply goes and takes it and takes it from someplace else. So that's why you sort of have these standards. I don't think we can really get away from that. I think, I think what we can do is say, okay, fine. What 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 areas are actually viable for blue carbon under our sort of standards? And then beyond that, okay, fine. What else can be supported by traditional conservation? Because these are the focus of traditional conservation. These ecosystems and are already the, the focus of traditional conservation. And ultimately, um, all of this, all of these sorts of actions can go towards helping um, a country's uh, ambitions in climate change mitigation through nature-based solutions. So I think um, maybe the funding community, the Global Environment Facility, or the Green Climate Fund can say, okay, fine, we're going to focus on restoration of mangroves or conservation of mangroves, and then we're going to focus some on, on pure blue carbon, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a, um, a question from Amelia, which picks up, actually, and I was going to ask you something similar, picks up on your uh, example from Ecuador, which um, you, you're, well, you seem to strike, strike a very good balance between the uh, uh, the right, the fishing rights of the community and the conservation restoration uh, investment and um, uh, in a sense uh, you, you know ensuring that the the local fishing communities have got a kind of clear tangible return to the project and so on and I suppose one of the big you know one of the big issues that's often raised with um, terrestrial particularly uh, forestry um, based um, carbon offsettings is that you know you know you've got these giant forests plant planted that have been you know purchased by a company like shell um you know they're, they're doing all the fossil fuel extraction uh they're, they're they're you know investing in these huge offsets uh ownership of the of that local environment transfers often to uh the offsetting uh, vehicle or the fun the, the the company or the finance vehicle that's purchased the land or planted the forest um, it's vulnerable to, you know, the forest can, can burn down given climate change, you know, if you've got forest fires, etc. Um, and, I, and I suppose, so one of the kind of, uh, you know, that debate, which has been particularly uh, concerned with those kinds of reforestry projects, um, does seem to translate obviously to the concerns and you raised the, the campaign uh, meeting that was held in Glasgow. Um, about the rights of local communities. Well, where is the sort of, if you like, the kind of sweet spot of ownership and social justice alongside conservation and restoration? Well, um, under the, the, the mechanism that we were working on, the Plan Vivo uh, mechanism, communities are, are put at the forefront. And I think that, that these projects that we've implemented in Kenya and in Madagascar are the sweet spot. 
There was actually a previous exploration of blue carbon in Senegal um, for insetting, um, but it, it actually got quite a lot of negative feedback for social impacts. Um, so yes, you can do blue carbon wrong. Right. <laughs> but the danger is that since there's such an increased demand out there for blue carbon as a product, um, that we, we're seeing sort of the cowboy days of, of blue carbon in the voluntary carbon market. And when I'm approached by blue carbon brokers, they're essentially looking to make a profit. They would like to offer $100,000 for 1,000 hectares, where they get the rights to the carbon, they pay a community a certain amount, and then later on, they can maximize the profits for themselves. Well, we work with the United Nations Environment Program, so I can't, I can't frankly help private businesses do these sorts of deals because it could end up in very bad social outcomes for communities. Yeah. Um, and you know, this, is a, this is an issue that's just come up recently and I think definitely deserves a lot, lot more attention. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'm just uh, scrolling down some of the other questions just to see whether I've um, uh, answered these. Um, uh, Mona Candil asked a question about um, seaweed. I think you mentioned earlier on, it says, um, do you think seagrass will be one blue carbon? Because when we say blue carbon, we mean mangrove, saltgrass, and unfortunately seaweed not included. I think I heard you say kelp and seaweed early on. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, so kelp, uh, kelp and macroalgae are being explored. And, and here in Norway, we're doing a lot to explore. And also in New Zealand and, and Australia, there's, there's, there's many researchers that are looking at exploring this value of kelp. In fact, right now we're, we're just putting together a global kelp assessment for the United Nations Environment Program, which has a whole section on um, uh, on kelp ecosystems and carbon, but it's a different sort of type of mechanism and um, way to way to you know how do you measure it? Because when a kelp sort of leaf breaks off, it'll float away and it'll eventually go down mm -hmm. in a fjord at the at the bottom of the of of of, of, the, of the aqueous part of the fjord. But how do you actually measure that, that that's occurred as to it just sort of breaking up and dispersing or or ending up on the shoreline? So it's a different type of methodology, um, but I think. Uh, there is, you know, similar type of type of issue with the seagrass carbon because when seagrasses are degraded, you know, the, those seagrass blades end up in shallow aqueous environment. What happens to them, etc. So these are these are some questions that are being answered. It's just it just so happened that when blue carbon was introduced through those reports in 2009, the immediate focus became on these three ecosystems, and it's take uh, taken a little bit of coaxing by scientists to have the international blue carbon community now, I think a little bit begrudgingly accept kelp. And in that, in that uh, brief that, that, was, that, I, sh that, I, sh that I shared that the, that the civil society put out, they've also included bottom trawling, um, even though that's just based on one paper um, uh, as, as blue carbon. Um, so I think it's, it's a just a matter of time between the, before kelp's even more significantly realized. And of course, the marine vertebrates as well that are actually pulling the carbon down into the sediments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did I hear you say trawling? Because I, I was going to ask you a, a question just about um, fishing practices and in particular dredging yeah. and the impact that dredging has on the uh, seabed and on, I mean, obviously further down at the bottom of the ocean floor, that's a, a different prospect. But um, uh, I mean, are, are there, in addition just to overfishing, are there other kinds of, you know, uh, industry practices in the extraction of resources from the oceans that yes. like dredging that need so, to change. So, so, so I'll, I'll start with plastics and then I'll go to, to, mm. to dredging. So plastics, you know, a lot of the plastics in the ocean ends up as microplastic particles. Yeah. And these microplastic particles actually bond with the marine snow and these other sorts of carbon rich particles that are existing in the ocean. And since they have different buoyancy, they affect, they are potentially affecting the sinking rates of carbon in the ocean. Okay, so that's, that's quite, that's quite uh, scary <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to think of that, all these little plastic bits that are, that are, that are basically um, preventing the natural flow of this carbon or at least inhibiting it in some manner. And then with bottom trolling, a significant paper came out just last year by Enric Sala et al, including a lot of co-authors, um, looking at the issue of bottom trawling and raising it as um, basically that the bottom trawlers are going through and stirring up the sediments in the bottom. This is, is going into the, uh, the water column and then potentially getting released back into the atmosphere. A lot of media around that article said that that carbon is related to all the emissions of, 
of airlines, but it wasn't actually making the connection between the carbon that just gets circulated in the water column versus carbon that's going to go back into the atmosphere. Obviously, that carbon that is in your surface waters, we would like to see it still be, you know, obviously, we don't want it to be into the atmosphere. And when you bottom trawl and, and degrade ecosystems, you're, you're destroying habitats for fish destroying rugosity that could actually help capture the carbon or, or store the carbon. So I would say that, um, that, that, that bottom trawling is, 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 is definitely potentially impacting our ability to store and sequester carbon. But, but one question that I, I, I missed from that, from that report is the annual impact of seasonal storms in shallow water environments. Because bottom trawling stores a lot, stores a lot of sediments. Well, if you've lived in the, in the coastline and seen a hurricane or any sort of tropical storm go, go through in, in, in tropical areas, you'll, you'll know that water gets stirred up quite a lot, in, especially in your shallow waters. So it may be that certain types of bottom trawling are more important for this than others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I suppose that also to blue carbon. Um, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't you hear you talk about the potential. Sorry, um, I suppose that, uh, that what you ended with there also raises the question about what the warming of the oceans, what climate, the, the impact of climate change on oceans it, itself means. I and mean, you talked earlier about rising sea levels and projects being able to, add, you know, adaptation projects being able to um, uh, help communities cope with rising sea levels. But I wonder whether the, the, the what the impact on blue carbon stores is of the oceanic warming processes that we're seeing. So, well, you, you see these these shift in in, in in populations of fish, mm. you know, the, the different migrations, different ha and, and and you know ha habitats as well. I mean, these these different these different ecosystems are going to start thriving or declining in different areas. Mm. So so yes, it's 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 quite significant. I mean, I think um, under the Paris Climate Ag Agreement, countries are supposed to be able to take stock of their of their stores of carbon in in their in their ter in their territories, and coastal blue carbon. Uh, oceanic blue carbon and sedimentary blue carbon are all part of that. And it, once you have a good accounting, then you can understand changes to that accounting. It's those changes to the accounting which yeah. either result in more emissions or through positive actions like conservation, the, the mitigation of those emissions. And one of those, those changes is, yes, uh, the impacts of, of climate change on, on these ecosystems. Myself, I, 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 I'm sort of more focused on the mitigation side of things. Yeah. So i.e. how these things mitigate uh, climate as opposed to how they're getting impacted by climate. But. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Stephen, I, th I think we've, I think uh, if I've um, read my Q&A correctly, that we've answered all the questions that have been put to you uh, and you've, you've spoken brilliantly across a whole range of issues there. Um, so um, I want to thank you very much for your contribution this evening, uh, for coming and joining us. Uh, uh, and, um, and giving such a, 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 a comprehensive and um, I would say not just sort of scientifically interesting, but also just politically very Im important presentation. I mean, what you had to say has some very significant consequences for public policy. So from our perspective as a policy institute, uh, we're really pleased to hear what you said as well this evening. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for introducing us and, and, and being with us this evening. Thank you to all of our um, audience for, um, uh, for listening in, for posting in your questions. Um, I would encourage you all to keep in touch with the Institute and to keep in touch with our ocean series. We've got more coming up, um, which I hope will be of real interest to you. Uh, but for now, um, a very big thank you, Stephen, for joining us this evening, uh, all the way from Norway. Thanks for giving us the benefit of your considerable expertise and your commitment. Um, and uh, 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 as I said at the beginning, we will have your lecture in the form of a podcast and a video. So people that have not been able to catch up tonight or you want to re-watch it, re-listen, you'll be able to do so. So thanks very much indeed, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Vice-Chancellor. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, a very good evening to you.